<laughs> That's it. Good morning. All right, you you can go. And the and the kids have already gone. I got no I got no messages for you guys. Nothing to say except get out. That's it. Get out. And for once they listen. <laughs> I can just keep making comments. But anyway. All right. So um we're gonna be in Acts chapter eleven today. And um just as you turn there, um as you're turning, I'll go ahead and pray. Father, I just I thank you so much for each and every person here. Father, I thank you that we can just come and and fellowship with you, hear with your word. Uh, even as we take part in this, Lord, we see ourselves, we see our own church, we see the body of Christ, Lord, um, brought forever before you by your blood, as we sang this morning, um, to rescue us from that danger of an eternity without you. You interposed your blood on our behalf. And now, Lord, in spite of all of our differences, our craziness, our weirdness, our everything, you you bring us together as one. And, and I just praise you for it, and I thank you for it, and pray that you just open it up to us today. You do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, let's see. Okay. I actually started a timer this morning. We'll see if I can stick to it, right? Um Hey, we got through three chapters Wednesday. We really did. Honestly, we did. Um, yes. We, yeah, Michael still is incredulous. He doesn't believe it really happened, but it did. Um, so as you're turning to Acts chapter 11, just keep in mind, um, we saw this incredibly amazing event that happened right before we get to Acts chapter 11. Um, and if you're there, just go ahead and go back a few verses and look at Acts chapter 10, verse 44 with me. Because here we got Peter, he was sharing the gospel, and he had just shared, and, and we talked about this, how many of the times when we read in the scriptures it seems kind of truncated or shortened, and that's because, you know, they had to write everything on a scroll, and the book of Acts would have taken a little mini truck to carry around, you know. So, you know, literally they say that um, scroll-wise, the book of Acts would have been about 45 foot long. You know, that's a lot to carry. So... You know, as we go into this, and Peter was still speaking these words, so while he was just sharing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, he had shared who Jesus was, what he did, and then he said, and those who believe. And when he did, while he was still speaking, he didn't even get to his point. He didn't even say, you know, something like, anyone who would like to receive Jesus, just come to the front, or anything like that, right? Right in the middle of what he's talking, boom, the Holy Spirit falls. Crashes down on everybody fell upon all those who heard the word. Verse, verse 45, And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked him to stay a few days. So pause right there as we come into it. It was a beautiful thing. We called it, you know, as many have from, you know, from time immemorial, the Pentecost of the Gentiles, right? Because here was this incredibly exclusive club, for lack of a better term, called the Jewish faith, that required you to commit to them to become a believer. You know, to truly become a believer and experience salvation as it was, you had to be circumcised. You had to, and by this time, they had actually instituted the baptism, which was totally cleaning yourself, which you knew they had to do on a regular basis, right? If they stepped on a dead dog walking down the road, they, oh, man, you know, i got to take a bath now, right? That kind of thing, you know? So, you know, there's, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's so strange and it's so weird. And we look at it and we go, man, it's so crazy. But it really set them apart. It really set them where when people saw them, they knew who they were. You wouldn't run into a Hasidic Jew and go, oh, I wonder what he believes in. You knew it, right? And, and here, they're like, they're part of this exclusive club. Yeah, everybody knows who we are, right? It's that kind of thing, you know. I, you know, you know who I believe in. I'm, I'm a man of God. That's one of the reasons some people wear those little cleric things, but my neck's too big. I'm not wearing that, right? 
And sometimes I don't want people to know because I'm being dumb out there, right? But anyway, we'll move on from that one. Pray for me. Um, But here, you know, it's so amazing to me because notice what it says. Those of the circumcision came with him, right? So he, Peter, when he goes, you know, he's sitting there in Joppa, and and they've invited him to go share the gospel in this rich man's house, Cornelius. We talked about this. So who does he have from the church go with him? He picks those that he knows will be opposed against him. He picks those of the circumcision, the most critical people he could get, right? All of them are probably deacons in whatever church they're in, right? Because they're critical, okay, number one, right? So he's like, you guys come. You guys come with me. Can you imagine the conversation all the way from Joppa to Caesarea, right? It's like almost two days walking. You know, what do they talk about? What do they think about? Did you know, no doubt Peter shared the gospel with the guys as they're walking. It's just some incredible things that are happening here. You know, and, and then they get there and they share it. And then Peter, right, playing that game and kind of outing these guys in front of everybody. Hey, the Holy Spirit, God just said these guys are saved. And what does Peter do? He looks at the guys of the circumcision. He says, hey, baptize them, right? He says, you go baptize them. And they did. So that's kind of one of those in-your-face things a little bit to me as I'm seeing it. And Peter, you know, he's like, can you say, since God has approved these people, can you say they couldn't be baptized? No, we can't. Go baptize them. Right? Imagine that, you know, later on, once these guys change, if they ever do, imagine being part of that event. You... Just going with Peter. Peter sharing the gospel and right in the middle of it. Bam, the Holy Spirit falls. And, and then he says, you bapt- and you're baptizing some of the first Gentile converts to Christianity, not to Hebrewism or Hebraism or to Israel. Right? You are baptizing them into Christianity, into a faith in Christ. Imagine being part of that. And these guys are taking part in it. But look what happens here because it says they asked him to stay a few days. What did these guys do? Well, we're going to see. It looks like they jetted straight back to Jerusalem. All right. They were like, okay, yeah, that was great. Good time, everybody. Let's go. We've got to go talk to the church. That's exactly what they did. Because look, what happens here? Look at verse 1 of Acts chapter 11. And I'm calling sections 1, you know, verse 1 through 3, the circumcision or accusation. Okay. Verse 1, now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Stop right there. Because look at what happens. And, and, you know, I've actually seen this happen in certain places and with certain churches. And it's like, you know, oh, they received Jesus. Oh, it was so great. Oh, you know, and, and, and most people would celebrate and say, hey, people received Jesus Christ. But then... These guys go, but look, let's look at what you did now. You know, they don't, they don't, there's no celebration here. There's no grand thing. There's no, you know, oh, how awesome, Peter. That was so awesome. That was great, great, you know, great message, great nothing. It's like um, you ate with those Gentiles. It is an outright, uh, it, and look at the people that he's talking to here, the groups that are here, the apostles. All the apostles are here. Is it all of them? I don't know. It doesn't say that in the text, but there's apostles here. These are guys that walk with Jesus, right? And none of them are celebrating. They're all probably looking at Peter going, oh, man, what would you do now, right? As we call him the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth, right? You know, it's like, what has he said? What has he done this time? Okay? And these guys know Peter in a way most of these other people don't. Look at the other group, the brethren. The brethren are sitting around. Who's the brethren? That's everybody. That's everybody that's a believer is sitting there and nobody's celebrating. Nobody's praising. Nobody's doing anything. They're there to judge Peter. And then we see this other group, right? This other group, the circumcision. You know, and they called them the circumcision because it's not just because they were Jewish believers, because the apostles were, the brethren were. At this point in time, everybody was. They called them the circumcision because they believed, and this is one of the things we know just from 
the interactions we're going to see later on in the scriptures and everything is they believed that to truly be a Christian, you also had to be obedient to the law completely, which meant you had to convert to Judaism to become a believer in Jesus Christ. That was what they were saying. That was the circumcision. This was the party of the circumcision. And later on in Acts chapter 15, verse 5, we're going to see where it says, Some of the sect of Pharisees who believe rose up, saying it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. It doesn't mean that only the Pharisees were part of the circumcision group, but no doubt were a big part of it, you know, because they tended to be the legalists, the lawyers, the guys who picked apart everything, you know, the one you would go to and you say, hey, I got a little mint garden, and he'd go, are you tithing from it? You know, that kind of guy. It's like, come on, dude, really? You know, it's a mint garden on my, on, you know, on my windowsill of my kitchen. And he'd say, well, if you really love God, that kind of guy, right? You know, it's the kind of guy you only invite over once. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yeah, that was great. See you later. All right. Um, and, and as we get into this, this is really seeming to be something that's becoming a big, you know, a divisive text in the church here, because it, there's a big force that's beginning to say you have to be Jewish to be Christian. And then there's this other big force that's simply saying, God is here to save us all. You know, God is not, you know, he's not, you know, just thinking about the Jews. There's not thinking about, you know, it's getting out of that nationalistic mentality of what's going on here. And we'll talk a little bit later more about the circumcision. But it says here now, you know, look at the text again, because it says the Gentiles who would also receive the word of God. What does that mean to them when they're thinking about this? When Luke writes this, what is he trying to communicate when he says that they received the word of God? It means that they received who Jesus was. They had come to understand who he was and what he did and then accepted it. Okay? It doesn't mean that they heard of a generic Jesus and then said, okay, I'm in. You know, that's not what happened here. They literally hear who Jesus is, what he is. John chapter 1, verse 1, no doubt Peter shared something very similar to this and said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus was not just a man that was really good and died for your sins. He was God come in the flesh, dwelt among us, died for your sins so that he would die for all mankind. And it blew their minds here. Because they know this. They know this. They know John chapter 1 verse 1. They're teaching it in the church already. You know, we, we, we look in the book of 1 Corinthians, which was written within a few years of, after Paul was converted. Right? And the things that he talks about, the depth of what we call theology that was already existent in the church. And yet here, this is happening, what, I think it, it, between 10 and 15 years after Christ has been resurrected, and yet they still think you have to be Jewish to be a believer. And they're amazed that here are these people who don't even know what it means to be Jewish, who haven't converted yet, who have received it, and it's blowing their minds. So what do we do, you and me, when something comes into our world that kind of upsets the way we think sh things should be, right? We find something. I'm going to find something to pick on here. Right? Well, I can't argue that God gave him the Holy Spirit. I mean, those other guys. And, and I know this guy. He's a real stand-up guy, and he says they're saved. Right? Because he's of the circumcision, so he believes just like me. Right? Because that's what's going on. They're taking their word for it, so what do they do? They also take their word for it and say, okay, I'm, now I'm going to criticize Peter. Because i got to get something out of this. Right? You know? you got to follow the rules, Peter. you got to follow the rules. And, and, and there's a sense to that. There's a reality to that that you and I need to understand. Yeah, there, there are things that we should do as believers in Jesus Christ. But is there a law? Is there a rule? No, these guys are contending with Peter, it says. They contended with Peter. Yeah, they received the word of God. Okay, that's a God thing. I'm not arguing about that. I'm arguing about this other God thing that you're eating with them. And when they do this, that word contended is that same word we use for competition. You know? It's like that one guy, that one person you always meet that you don't want to play Monopoly with or Canasta or anything like that, right? 
It's like, I, I really don't want to play. You know, if Mark comes over, no, I, I don't want to play cards with him. You know, I, don't, I just don't want to do that. You know, or, or you play get you, you know you play a game and you got like eight people around and there's always that one person going no that's not the rules you know and they're really just you're like man it's a game bro and then, but you know I tend to be that guy too because I'm like well I'm losing here so we need to follow the rules <laughs> and and here they're contending with him it's that same thing man you know and, and they're just like you went home and you ate with uncircumcised men and there's a couple of things that this tells us what does it tell us. They're contending with Peter. So he's not a pope. He is not the leader of the church. He's not the potentate. He doesn't say what goes and what doesn't. Okay? All right? That's the first thing it tells you. Because you don't call a pope on the carpet. The pope calls you on the carpet. All right? If he really is a pope. And Peter ain't a pope. Peter is Peter. He is an apostle. He's been chosen by Jesus Christ to share the gospel to the world but he's still a man. We'll see later on when we get to um, Galatians where Paul chews Peter out. You know what I'm saying? So he ain't nothing but a man. So Peter's not a pope. He, he is a leader in the church. He is one of the 12, right? But he's still just a man. And the same Holy Spirit that dwells in him now dwells in Cornelius and people in his household and in you. And there is nothing, absolutely no difference. God doesn't look and go, ah, Logan's great, but he's not Peter, right? That's not what God does. You know, he doesn't look. He looks at you and he goes, ah, there's my son, Jesus. And there's my son, Jesus. And there's my son, Jesus. Because each and every one of us had to be covered. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? So, what does it also tell us? It tells us that the early church, because most of us are going, are we, are we a book of Acts church? Are we in unity? You know, are we perfect and are we in agreement? They're not even in agreement. Hello, you want to be a book of Acts church? Let's get in a fight after, right? Seriously, look at it, you know. They're not perfect. They're wrestling with their flesh. They're wrestling with rules and law. And saying, man, you guys. And, and, and that's what's happening here. Paul calls them the work of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And he's even going to say in 1 Corinthians 11, 11, 19, that there must be factions among you so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. He said there has to be contention in the church because the devil's always fighting for it. He told him in the book of Acts, he's going to tell the guys in Ephesus, he's going to say there's going to be wolves. There's going to be guys. There's going to be wolves coming in dressed like sheep among you. Because it's the church. It's the work of God that's going on on this earth, and the enemy wants to destroy it. So if we're all hunky-dory and everything's good, then we're just a social club. Everybody's voted. Everybody's getting what they need out of it. And let's just let it ride. But if this is a work of God and God's doing something in your life, then you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight to be here. You're going to have to fight your flesh in the morning and go, get out of bed, go. But I don't want to. I want to watch the game or I just want to sleep late or I just want to do this. And then you never end up doing it anyway, especially if you had kids. That's another story. You know, but we get into this and we begin to look at this. This isn't just about clean and unclean here this is about a group of guys who believe that they are set apart because they've been told by their families their whole lives you're better you're different and now god is saying mm, yeah not so much that's pretty much exactly what is going on here this is about getting away from the way it's always been the way it's always been done it's that same thing that you know one of the things that we came in you know, even talking with Tony coming into the ministry and doing this is, you know, I'm not a typical pastor. I'm not. You know, I'm, yeah, well, no, really, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I try not to hide who I am. I try not to present some kind of front or something like that, you know. If I'm weak, I'm going to show it. If I'm mad, I'm going to show it, you know. I, I'm not the perfect guy. I don't, you know, I'm not the perfect counselor. I'm not the perfect anything. You know, that's not who I am. That's who he is. You want a wonderful counselor, almighty God, prince of peace, go to Jesus Christ, not Robert. 
And it's silly when a pastor puts himself in that position and begins to make everybody look to him to get fulfillment because that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to point you at him. And if you're looking at me, man, you're messed up, you know. And I'm not doing something right, too. Because, guys, we were looking at this. You cannot be the same old, same old. You cannot do that. Each and every time when you take a breath, just do it real quick. Take a breath. Now, hopefully you brushed. You know, the people in front of you know if you didn't or not. But that thing is when you take that breath and you're breathing in, you're breathing in that oxygen and you're feeding your body and it's a part of you now. And it's that same thing with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand as we look into this, this is one of the things that's happening with Peter and these guys is he wants you to look at him. And he's telling these guys, it's not about whether I eat dinner with these guys. It's about the fact that the Holy Spirit is in them. So Peter begins to go into the story or his defense. Look at verse 4. Let's just read verses 4 through 15. Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning. And that word in order from the beginning is to expound. That's what he's doing. He's expounding. He says, I, I was in the city of Joppa praying. So he doesn't start with Cornelius' vision. Notice, he's telling the story from his point of view. I, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance. Notice what he did, left out there. Anybody know? What did he leave out? No. What did he leave out? I'm sure the circumcised guy said he was saying it was Simon and Tanner. What did he leave out? That he was hungry, right? Because remember uh, in, the, in uh, chapter 10, he had said he was hungry and they were making lunch and then he went up on the roof to pray. So he lives out and he was hungry. I just think it's interesting because he's like, if I tell him I'm hungry, then they're, you know, I wonder how many times he rehearsed this walking back to Jerusalem from Caesarea, right? And they're going to say, oh, what am I going to say? And that kind of thing, right? <clears throat> I, <laughs> if I say that, they're going to automatically think, so... It was in the city of Joppa praying, but he did leave out the tanner too. Good catch, Michael. And in a trance, I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners. Where, where, did, it, where did it come from? Heaven. That's right. Let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and the birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, No, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. Now, most of the time, you hear Peter say that, and you're like, you don't think of Peter as the law follower guy, right, do you? Right? You think of Peter as the bumbling, you know, big brash, you know, ah, we do what Peter wants, right? But that's not what it is. He's like, you know, I've never, never, ever eaten anything unclean. I've followed the law. But the voice answered, me again from heaven. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And you got to think, man, when Peter's sharing this, he's just thinking about Cornelius. Can you imagine the smile on Cornelius' face after the Holy Spirit filled him? And Peter is thinking to himself, I would have called him common. I would have denied him this gospel. Verse 10, now this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that moment, at that very moment, guys, three men stood before the house where I was. Having been sent to me from Caesarea, then the Spirit told me to go to them doubting nothing. And then he points at the guys that are in there with him. The six guys, right? These six brethren accompanied me and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa. Call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which, which you and all your household will be saved. That's just crazy. Yeah, he leaves out Simon the Tanner again, right? You know, think of that, man, to have a vision for God to tell you. And that, I think that happens to people a lot, especially when they're going to church for the umpteenth time and they don't really know God and they have that thing. But, you know, and, and normally they don't go or they haven't gone in years. And then God puts a thing on them and says, today you need to go. I want to talk to you today. I got something to say to you today. 
and then we go, man, and he just blows our doors off. You know, and this is what's happening with Cornelius. God is saying, I'm, I'm going to save you. Call for this guy. He's got the words you need to hear. And as I began to speak, so Peter is like, hey, I just gave him my intro, right? I just had a really long intro, did my intro, and boom. As I begin to speak, verse 15, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Wow. It's, you know, it's kind of mind-blowing as you get here. Let's just stop there and kind of take a look about it because he says these six men. And when he says the six, it, you know, it, again, he's pointing at Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, which says, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So the uppermost part of that law, as it were, which is two or three, so three, Peter brings double the amount necessary, right? goes above and beyond what's required to have as a witness there on his behalf, okay? So as they go into this, and, and you know, again, most of us would think, because most of us would think, well, he's Peter. Who wouldn't want to go to an evangelistic meeting with him? He, you know, he wasn't that big a deal in the early church. You and I think of it as, now, according, you know, what happened in Joppa? Yeah, that was a big deal because he's healing people and they're seeing it and they're going, wow, wow, we need that. Whoa, bring that over here and that kind of stuff, right? So that's the big deal. But the moment they begin, that he begins to behave in a way that they see as unseemly, call him on the carpet, right? And, you know, in chapter 10, verses 44 through 46, Peter took those that disagreed with him. And the Holy Spirit told them how they should be saved. Call for Peter. He's going to share the gospel with you. This is going to happen. You know, Jesus said as much would happen. In John chapter 16, verses 5 through 11, it says, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, now go away to him who sent me. But none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. See, Peter's experiencing this right now. Because he says, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Why did Jesus rise from the dead and go? So we could be filled. So you and I would have that experience of the Holy Spirit and walk in it. And look what he says. You know, look what he said. Well, you can't look because I didn't tell you to turn, so never mind. Okay? He says, I, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, so this is the same Holy Spirit that has gone to Cornelius. Because some of us would go, well, what if Peter did? Why didn't Peter share this? Or why didn't Peter say this? Because the Holy Spirit's there, guys. The Holy Spirit is involved in this. Because he says in John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, you know, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, verse 8, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you will see me no more. And of judgment, because the ruler of this world is just. So you see, Peter is telling them, he is like, it's not a thing that I did. I didn't talk these guys in, into Christianity. The Holy Spirit saved them. I was just there. And that's the thing that you and I need to understand when we do share our faith, when we do share these words. You know, you don't have to be perfect in it. You don't have to do it just right. You don't have to follow the way of the master, which is a great way. Don't misunderstand me. You know? Nor do we have to follow the, the Romans road. Nor do we have to, again, the Holy Spirit, he says, will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the Holy Spirit made an appointment with, with Cornelius and then said, hey, you're going to make an appointment with Peter and then you're going to do all these things and you're going to come together and this is going to happen. And the conviction that Peter is talking about here, and at the end of this, as he says this, he says, just like you and I, when we were there at Pentecost, guys, he's, you know, no doubt looking at the mainly the apostles' face. There was 120 people in that room. And he says, all you guys, 
The same thing that happened to us up there happened here. Ask these six guys, they'll tell you. And that's mind-blowing, right? It's a conviction, not because of Peter's words again, but because of what is Jesus has done through him in the Cornelius and his household and is now doing in front of these Jews whose hearts are so hard and don't want to let go of the rules because that's how we did it, you know? If I had to go through it, you got to go through it, that kind of thing, right? And here, he says, now the Holy Spirit, just like from the beginning, fell upon them. And then he gives his closing argument. Look at verses 16 through 18. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Wow. That's kind of crazy there. And it's, we're going to look at these things and kind of, we're not going to, you know, completely pick them apart or go into them in, in complete and utter depth. But I do want to examine it because he says, baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's quoting what he heard in the Gospels. He's quoting the same thing that Jesus told him in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. But in the Gospels, you know, they were told by John the Baptist even before this all began in Mark chapter 3, verse 11, Mark, or Matthew 3, 11, Mark 1, 8, and John 1, 26 and 33. But we see Jesus say to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And he, said, and he says that to them, and then we see every, almost every instance of people being filled with the Holy Spirit from this point. There is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is it something that we manufacture or can do? No. No. That's not something that I have the power to do or to give. Peter didn't touch these guys, right? Peter didn't go, boom, Holy Spirit, or wave his jacket or nothing like that, right? These people here and are filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's not, it's not through the hands of Peter. You know, it's not given as an appointment that is done by people sharing the gospel. It is God inhabiting his people. It is the same thing that Jesus said in the book of John. He said, I will dwell in you and you will dwell in me. This is that Holy Spirit. If you are a believer, truly a believer in Jesus Christ, the reason you are able to confess him as Lord is because he lives in you. Go read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 when you get a chance. And look at what it says. It says your confession is something that comes out of your heart. Jesus said it's not what goes into you, but what comes out from the heart. You see. And when you truly express what God has done on the inside, that's that baptism of the Holy Spirit that has come upon you. Ezekiel, this is something that they knew from their scriptures. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. God said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. He's saying, you know, because a lot of people go, well, you know, as you know, believers in Jesus Christ, we're free to pretty much do almost anything. It's like, well, the same Holy Spirit that wrote the entire Bible is now living within you. Do you really think he wants to go party? Right. Not in the way you may used to. I do think he wants to have a good time with you. But not the way the world does it. He wants you to experience him in a whole new way. This is an amazing and beautiful thing as we get into it. And these guys, again, they've been doing it for 10 years now. But it's this new, fresh thing still. And, and they don't get it yet. They don't get the logic that comes with it, even though their own scriptures say it, right? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, God is talking to the people and he says, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So when Jesus says, you know, you're supposed to love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your strength, he's saying that's what a circumcised heart looks like. And he's, who does he say does it? Does he say you do it? No, he just read it. He said, my Holy Spirit's going to do it in you. 
because, frankly, you stink at it. I do. I do. I do. I, you know, you ask my wife. She's like, oh, yeah, that, that, that wasn't the Holy Spirit right there, Robert. You know, <laughs> that was definitely you. Right. And, and you can you can see it in us. You can see when we're walking in him. You can see when we're moving in him. You can see when we're ministering in him. And it's so beautiful and so amazing to realize that something's been done in you that you didn't manufacture and do yourself. Now, sometimes there are times where I do need to just, you know, because I'm not feeling it or I'm like, okay, he's not here, but I know I'm supposed to do this. So let me just do this. That's going to happen sometimes. Love is not an emotion. It's a choice. You know, you can't sit there. It, you know, it's the same thing. I cannot, I cannot sit there and promise to someone. I heard someone say this and, you know, they put it so eloquently, but I'll see how bad I can slaughter it. You know, I heard someone say to the effect of when we become married, you know, you can't sit there and promise to someone that your feelings are never, ever, ever going to change. That's dumb. But you can promise someone to say, I will love you and stay with you for the rest of my life. Why? Because I'm making a conscious choice and decision to do it. I'm not saying I'm going to have the same emotions for you day in, day out, 24-7. That's silly. I don't even have the same emotions for myself day in, day out, you know. There are days where I hate myself, right? Because I'm a human being. But Paul is going to say later on in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, he is a Jew, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. The circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. But these guys don't get this yet, but God is doing surgery on them. The same way that he, you know, he took Adam apart and made humanity, male and female. In the image of God. And now he's making this new creature in Christ Jesus, which is the church, which is us. And it's a change that can only be affected by his grace and by his Holy Spirit. Don't go try circumcising your own heart. It won't work out well for you. Okay? All right? Not a good thing. Okay? And God is, has done an obvious work here, and Peter is pointing it out. And for some of you, you know God's done a work in you. Because you know what you were like before. And you know what you're like now. And you know that the desires that are natural to you now are different than the ones that were natural to you before. I'm not saying you don't have those. Because the world goes, hey man, come on, we're having fun over here. Right? And your new heart goes, that's not right. That's an illusion. And it's going to be a trap if I fall into it. And here, he's like, God has done a work in this, and you guys got to see this. God has performed an act. He has done something. You know, and he's like, and, and he says to them, right? He says to them, how could I withstand God? What kind of idiot would stand in the way of something like that, you know? He's like, God was doing something. What was I going to go, well, wait a minute, God, right? You know, I'd already done that when he lowered the sheep. I was like, oh, but no, Lord, right? I did that once today. I'm done, right? This time, God did a work, and I just said, yay and amen, baptize them fools, right? We're done. I'm getting out of here, right? Paul's going to explain it later, and, you know, I would just encourage you to read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through chapter 3, verse 12, um, because he explains it in really great detail there, because he says in in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision, but it was what is called the circumcision made in flesh by hand. So he says there was a huge difference between you there. But then he goes on to explain it, and in verse 19 of uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, he says, you are therefore now no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God because of what Jesus has done. And he says that this was a great mystery. He says it was something... The church itself didn't understand even once it started. You guys coming into it. You know, we knew we were supposed to reach the Gentiles, but we thought we were supposed to make you all Jews. But Jesus had something else in mind. And thank goodness for that, because I saw this really awesome recipe for like bacon jam, and it just looks awesome. And I could not imagine not being able to eat that. You know what I'm saying? All right. I know. It's like, hey, it's what I do. Um. You know, but this mystery really affects them. It really messes with these guys because, you know, 
that's why they are blown away at the end, and they say God has granted life to the Gentile, you know, granted the Gentiles repentance to life. They can repent of their sins and be saved without, you know, not eating bacon, without having to grow their hair or their beards, without having to dress like us or be like us or, you know, they can be saved without that. What does that mean for us? You see, and this is always what it comes around to. One of the reasons we tend to resist changing the things that we do in a religious manner or, you know, in those perfunctory things that we do in our own way of worshiping God. You know, I kind of worship in my own way. I kind of have my own thing, you know, me and the, and the man upstairs, right? And, and then God's like, eh, not so much. That's a thing you did. And now they're getting into that. They're realizing for me to say that I can't eat with somebody and do these things. And it's beginning to change their brains and it's blowing their mind. So when Peter, you know, he's he's basically, this is the revealing of the mystery. This is the 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 curtains beginning to part on this play that's going on with the Holy Spirit and what he's doing. Peter just puts it at the foot of the cross. No, I don't understand it. Yeah, but God doesn't have me here to understand it. He has me here to follow him and to share the gospel and to be simple about it. And and that's the same thing that he does here. He puts it at the foot of the cross and it shuts their pie hole, right? Because they're just like, you know, they they tried to turn it into you ate with circumcised people. And Peter turns it into God saved those uncircumcised people. What are you going to call them now? See, you and I often tend to, you know, we do the same thing. I tend to judge people that are made in the image of God, that are saved by him. And they make mistakes and they do things. And you and I tend to look at them and we tend to judge them. We tend to put them in a place. But here, Peter says, you know, guys, we are to be a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 49.6 says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth, period. It's funny because you and I think the ends of the earth are the jungles of South Africa, but technically we're the ends of the earth to where they started at. You know, the gospel has gone around the globe. The gospel has done its thing. And yeah, we're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. And who are the Gentiles? Anybody that doesn't know him. You and I are saved. We're adopted into the family of God. They are silent, yes, but it doesn't last long, right? Because contention, it doesn't. Um, We're going to see later in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're sitting here and Peter goes, saved. And everybody goes, glorify God. Wow. And then later on, not too much longer after that, they're going to go. Say, yeah, no, you guys got to get circumcised now. Follow the law. I'll teach you how to cut your hair. My dad taught me. It's really easy. Right? That kind of thing. Seriously. And it becomes a, another huge contention within the church. And we don't have time to look at it, but I would encourage you to read the entire chapter, verse 15 of the book of Acts. Um, and, you know, and take a look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, because in Galatians, Paul actually talks about the encounter that he had when he came back to Jerusalem. And through the book of Galatians, he's kind of talking about the encounter and issues that he had with fighting against the circumcision. But you and I, as we look in this, and I say this in closing, that, you know, there are many today that look at a work of God that is going on and they, you know, refuse to accept it because it doesn't fit into their conventions or what they think of as a spiritual thing or a spiritual act. They're not going by what the Bible says, but by what they learn, what they learn from their pastors, their rabbis, their priests, their whoever, you know, like I've shared with you before, I love my my aunt to death. Or my aunt. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say aunt, right? Okay, I love my aunt to death, okay? But, man, she taught me some really crazy things, okay? You know, like I was filled with old wives' tales and, you know, and and ghost stories and, 
um, you know, and little tips and tricks. And, and it was just so crazy, the things that I learned that as, a, you know, as a young man. But I couldn't apply those to my life anymore once I came to know him. Truly, I'd been crucified with Christ. I was dead to those things. Those things were not for me anymore. And as I come to understand it, you know, activity alone also does not mean it is a work of God. You know, just because a a place is really active and doing a lot of things does not mean that God is involved in it. It has to line up with both things. Are they doing a great work? Yes. Does it line up with the Word of God, the Bible? Not what I think it is, not what my pastor says it is, but what the Bible says. Does it line up with that? Yes. Then I will say that is a work of God. But great activity and flurry, men do that. A man can do a lot. He's made in the image of God. But is it a work of God? That's another story. You and I, we want to not fall into the trap of legalism, but we also don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that we can just do whatever because he says that his Holy Spirit dwells within us. He dwells within us. And you and I are a part of something that is amazing, just like this, this beautiful passage that we see in Scripture. And I want you to walk in that. I want you to understand right now that if you believe that Jesus Christ walked this earth, that He was God made into flesh. That He walked this earth, that He healed people, that He did miracles, that He raised the dead. And that He died on the cross for your sin. Each and every one of you, your mom can't save you, your family can't save you, your family's faith can't save you. In any way, shape, or form. You have to understand that He died for your sin. And do you, and I mean, do you really truly believe in your heart? Because Romans chapter 10 tells us this. Do you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead? That means do I believe it, that he rose from the dead? Because only God could do that. And if you truly believe that, not because you walk up here and accept something, not because you sign a little card that says you were saved, not because you just made a statement. You don't make contracts with God. He's either in here or he isn't. And if you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. And he says anyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. Amen. You know, and, and that's what I offer to you today is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit dwell within you, for you to know beyond the shadow of a doubt, the moment that you have that experience. It's not about a choice. It's not about a decision. It's not you making a, you know, again, it's not let's make a deal. It's this is salvation and it is the only way. And if you would accept him and believe him, then he will give you this gift of eternal life right now. You won't be saved later. You won't be saved if you're good enough. You'll be saved right now. Mm-hmm. Not because of legalism or rules, but because of the grace of God and what he'll do in you. Please stand with me if you would. And if there is anyone here today that, that wants to know more about being a Christian, about becoming a believer in Jesus Christ, let me know. I'll talk to you about it. If there's anyone here that, that wants to accept him and truly believe and, and follow after him, let me know. And we'll, we'll do it with you, man. Because we're all, you know, some of us, well, most of you, and again, I know most of you, most of you, man, we just got fingertips and we're grabbing on, you know. And this roller coaster is crazy sometimes. But we also know he has his hand on us. We feel like we're holding on by the skin of our teeth, right? But we have to understand that he has a hold of us and he'll never let us go. Stop struggling so much. Realize you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, that he dwells in you. And you need to let him clean house every now and then, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much as we come before you. And I pray if there's anyone here that does not know you, that they would come to know you right now and be filled by your Holy Spirit. Whether they would speak in tongues, whether they would glorify you, or whether they would simply come to know and understand and enter into a relationship with you that will never end. I pray that happens for them right now. I pray for those of us that know you, Lord, that we would put our pride aside, that we would stop, Lord, with our 
um, with our heavy hearts, with the things that we keep putting before you, Lord, the, uh, Father, the things that bring doubt to us, uh, Lord, that we would just give those to you, truly offer them as a living sacrifice, Lord, understanding and knowing that you have already saved us, that we do not need to fret or fear, that even death is nothing. Lord, help us to hold on to it. And for those of us, Lord, who I, I just I know, Lord, there's someone here who's got a calling, who you're working on, and I pray that you just continue to work in them, that um, they would, Lord, be patient for you to show them what it is that you're going to do with them. And Father, I just I thank you so much for your word. Your word, man, which just is, it, it's, it illuminates itself. It is the best commentary for itself. And as we see Peter, Lord, this imperfect man, <laughs> but yet when he just presents you the things that you do to him, when he's just willing to do what you call him to do, the things that you do for him, this man that we often look at as imperfect and faulty. Help us to do the same, Lord, not to argue for the sake of argument, but to present Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is our ideal. Dead for three days, risen from the grave, truly alive forevermore. And I just pray that we, we hold on to that. That it's real to us. Pray all these things for each and every person here in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You ready for that benediction? All right. It's the most liturgical thing we do, right? I think. Right? Yeah. Somebody says, what is your liturgy? It's like, what? Yeah. Until I get one of those collar things. That's right. Yeah. I wonder where I'll keep that. <laughs> so let's let's do this. All right, guys. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up 